Hello everybody, my name is Richard Smith. I'm the director of the Tank Museum here in Bovington and today I'm going to be looking at my bottom five tanks. Now when the team asked me to review my bottom five tanks. I realised it's actually a much more difficult task than it looks, actually significantly more difficult than looking at a top five. So difficult, in fact, that it cannot be achieved without the use of a clipboard. And when I was looking at my bottom five tanks, the real challenges here are based around the fact that there's an awful lot of dross here in the Tank Museum, but lots of it in our Vehicle Conservation Centre here, uh, which holds our reserve collections which aren't normally on display. And that's because a lot of the vehicles here are things like failed prototypes. Uh, and if I was going to do a bottom five tanks, just things that were worst, I would end up with all British failed prototypes. But when you're thinking about a design process, a failed prototype is actually a success if you've got the moral courage to stop the program when you realize the prototype doesn't work actually something has worked out quite well so i'm going to look at my bottom five tanks by looking not at failed prototypes but at things that went into production and didn't work or didn't achieve what they were meant to be doing and in particular what i'm going to be looking at are five unforgivable sins of design processes which produce the wrong thing. So that's the basis on which I'm going to be looking at my bottom five tanks. Now number five on my bottom five list is Matilda 1 and that's because the first of my unforgivable sins of design is to produce something that is obsolete even before it leaves the design table. Um, now the designers for Matilda 1 had some really difficult constraints, especially around the cost, but even allowing for that, they managed to come up with what can only be described as a complete and utter howler. Now if you look at this thing, the, the sorts of things to bear in mind here is, is that you've got a heavy, slow moving tank with tracks that go all the way around the hull and carrying a machine gun into battle. And what you've got here in practice is a First World War tank. You know, think Renault FT-17. You've got a First World War tank produced 20 years later. And the, the people who are involved in producing this tank, you can see how influenced they are by the lessons of the First World War. So, you know, Vickers have been producing tanks longer than anyone else. Uh, Hugh Ellis was a mas master of the ordnance at the time. He was, he's in charge of equipping the army, and he's, he was also the guy who was in charge of the First World War tanks. And so when they're producing this thing, they're looking at it saying, well, we know how to beat the Germans. This is, this is the system you use to do it. You use now, tanks as infantry support weapons to help the infantry smash their way through a defensive system. But to assume that the same enemy you defeated 20 years earlier will let themselves be defeated in exactly the same manner is foolishness at its worst. And yeah, this, this thing's going into production in 1937, at the point at which the Germans are refining Blitzkrieg into this you know, world-beating system. So as this tank was obsolete from the point it was conceived and throughout its design process, the Matilda 1 ranks number five on my bottom five list. Now number four on my bottom five tanks list is Yag Tiger, and that's because my next cardinal sin is contempt for supply chain. Before I came to the Tank Museum, I spent 11 years in the shipping industry, carrying all sorts of twiddly logistical stuff. And I learned a number of really key lessons while I was doing that. And probably the most important lesson was that there are basically two types of company about how they view the importance of logistics. First type takes it seriously and includes the logistics and supply chain people on the top table. 
the second type of organisation dispatches the shipping managers to drag their knuckles to the caverns underneath the building. And Yag Tiger says to me that the Germans in the Second World War were in the second category. Because if you look at this thing, what you've got here is you've got 70 you know, odd tons of steel for the country with the least steel. You've got a, a vehicle with obscene fuel consumption for the country that has the least petrol. Uh, you've got a, a gun, which yeah, yeah, it's a great gun, this 128mm gun, it's very, very powerful. But this is the only type of tank that Germans have that mounts this gun. And there's only 80 of these things in total, which means you have to have a whole parallel supply chain to supply those 80 vehicles. So with Jag Tiger, you know, it doesn't matter how good people at Otto Carriers think they are in operating these. The, then they don't find themselves on the losing side by mistake. So because it's an affront to logistics people everywhere, and this is a supply chain disaster zone, Yag Tiger is number four on my bottom five list. Number three on my bottom five tanks list is the A7V. And that's because my next cardinal sin, my next unforgivable feature of a design process is failure to manage requirements. Now, arguably the key role you must play in any major technology project is controlling the scope and requirements of what you're trying to achieve in the first place. And when that process goes wrong, you get something that looks exactly like the A7V. Now the Germans didn't enjoy fighting British tanks very much and it's clearly a little bit dispiriting to shoot at something that doesn't stop after you've hit it. Um, so they decide they're going to build their own tanks as a result and they start the process actually quite early they start the process of designing these things at the back end of 1916 so very shortly after their first encounter with British tanks um, and they get a prototype out by September 1917. However, the design team, which is led by a chap called Joseph Vollmer, either didn't have the authority or didn't have the, the breadth of thinking to leave anything out of their design. And what you get here is you get something that's it's got guns all over the place. It's actually quite, quite a good road speed. It's got heaps of protection. It's got uh, sophisticated suspension. But to do all these things, it requires a crew of something like 18 people. I mean, 18 people crewing one tank. So as well as this enormous crew, and it has some quite major flaws. So it's, it's so top heavy that it kind of tips over, it hits an obstacle. It doesn't really do off-road, which rather defeats the idea of having tracks in the first place. So this issue here is, is a real problem for the A7V that they, they're trying to do so many things and they're so complicated to make and they're so labour intensive that they only produce a total of something like 20 in all together of this design. So you know, I could pick any number of British peacetime designs to illustrate a, a, a failure of a requirement management, but this is a wartime design that goes into production and therefore because of the enormous failure to reduce requirements to a manageable level, the A7V comes in at number three on my bottom five tanks. Now number two on my bottom five list, I think is going to be one that generates all the comments because my next cardinal sin is usability. And that means my number two bottom five tank is Panther. Now this might seem an odd choice because Panther's often seen as the best of the German Second World War heavy tanks, but a lot of these things are relative and saying this is the best of the Second World War German tanks, this is a bit like saying I'm the best looking presenter on the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. If you set that bar low enough, you can always clear it. 
Now, there are many things to admire about the Panther. The, the gun is, is right up there with the best of the guns in the Second World War. The engine's not too bad in the greater scheme of things. Frontal protection, excellent. Um, but it's got a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem of this tank is the drivability. Um, now, it's not that it's impossible to drive, but there was an important structural problem with the final drives on this tank, which made it difficult to drive well. And the, the final drive problem is, is pretty well recorded, both by the Germans and by the French who used these after the Second World War. And that meant that if you didn't drive it well, the chance of a failure on the final drive is really high. And what you ended up with was a, a failure on the final drive, something like every 150 miles on average. And that's not a lot of range when you're trying to win with the best tanks on the battlefield. Now, the problem here, you see, is the Germans are trying to win with the most sophisticated kit. Uh, research by Professor John Buckley of Wolverhampton University has demonstrated that while they're trying to do that, by the back end of 1944, 30% of German armour losses are due to mechanical failure. And in the case of Panther, half of those mechanical failures are due to these final drive failures. Now, I walk around this particular tank uh, with an American chap called Tom Yentz. He's kind of like the, he was the guru of World War II German armour. And, and I walked around this with Tom just before he died, and I spent half an hour with him talking about this, this tank. I learnt more in that half an hour than the rest of my life put together. And Tom's analogy was that he was saying, you've got to look at these things, thinking about 18-year-olds in 1944. And he, he contrasted the experience of American 18-year-olds, Russian 18-year-olds, and German 18-year-olds. And what he was flagging up was that you know, the 18-year-old American by 1944 has driven ever since he could walk. Um, and he's driven everything you can drive and he gets loads of practice driving if he's going to become a tanker driving a Sherman and then he gets issued with a Sherman. The Russian 18 year old had probably driven a crappy 1940s Russian tractor and at that point when he goes into the army he's issued with a T-34 and that drives like a crappy 1940s Russian tractor. The German 18 year old hasn't driven anything before uh, joining the army, so there's no petrol, they, they, they can't afford the petrol in the country. He does a handful of hours of tracked vehicle training, probably on an on a obsolete Panzer III or something like that, you know, 20 tonnes lighter than this. And then he's issued with his Panther or Tiger, and this thing, probably the best analogy is to say, it drives a bit like a Porsche. If you give a Porsche to an inexperienced 18-year-old driver, you get predictable results. So the usability of this tank does not match its capability. And because the usability in practice therefore degrades the capability, Panther is number two on my bottom five list. Now, number one on my bottom five list, my candidate for worst ever tank is the Covenanter. And that's because the worst thing I think any designer can do in any technology project is design something that doesn't actually work. Now, I said earlier I've, I've worked in the shipping industry and I've, I've worked for three years in IT. And when I started working uh, in, in IT and developing new computer systems, I witnessed a, a, a discussion that left a lasting impression on me. Now, the discussion was between two chaps. It was between, one was my boss, who was a lovely, erudite, humane, insightful, absolutely tremendous chap, very thoughtful guy, and his technical opposite number. Now they were having what was probably best called a vigorous discussion about the finer points of requirement specification and the, uh, the weaponisation of the term sign-off. Anyone who works in technology will know exactly what I mean by the term weaponisation of sign-off. Um, and at one point my boss, in what was getting increasingly vigorous uh, uh, chat, um, stood up and he put his hands on the table and he used the rather memorable face, look, it doesn't jolly well work, okay? 
he didn't actually say jolly well. I'm paraphrasing slightly. He used a much ruder, slightly unnecessary word instead. But the sentiment was absolutely right. And this really stuck with me. And it's also the bottom line of any technology project. Now, so when you look at Covenanter, it doesn't look too bad. The original design is from the 1930s. It's done. All the design principles are, are really very good. The problem for this tank is it's, that the design is finished off in a real hurry in 1940 when things have gone a little bit skew whiff uh, on the continent. Um, and they're having to make a whole series of, of compromises. And the reason they're having to make those compromises is very good. They're expecting to take on the world's mightiest ever war machine with vehicles like the Beaverette, which, to be honest, leaves a little to be desired. And the problem with these compromises, in particular on this vehicle, is, is the, the engine and the power pack compared to the weight of the vehicle. The, the challenge they have is that the engine isn't really, the original concept isn't really enough to power this vehicle. So they need a, a bigger engine than it was originally planned for, which means they end up having to split the engine between the back of the vehicle and the radiators are put at the front, and that causes some inherent uh, difficulties. And in any project done in a hurry, you have to make compromises on how you manage your project. And you can see on this vehicle that where they made those compromises must have been in the testing. Because if they tested this vehicle properly, they'd have established that the pipes between the engine and the radiators leak like topsy, which means that the, they, the tank systemically overheats at the drop of a hat. And despite the fact that it had this you know, fundamental problem of overheating, they were in such a hurry, they churn out something like 1,400 of these things and none of them work, and actually none of them actually ever see any active service. They, they only ever end up being used for training purposes. So we produce 1,400 tanks that don't work at the absolute low point in, in our resources as a nation. So, because it doesn't jolly well work, the Covenanter is my worst ever tank and number one on my bottom five list of tanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed my bottom five tanks. If you've got any issues about my inclusion of Panther, please include them on one of David Willey's videos. If you did enjoy this video, then please support the Tank Museum through either subscribing to our channel, buying something from our online shop, or supporting us through Patreon. It all helps, especially in these times of coronavirus.